Lou Faz. Welcome to Dressing Room Interviews, Lou. Thank you, Joe. It's so good to be here again. I believe you're just about the best condition that I've seen you in the last uh, few years. What, what are you doing? What's, what, what goes on? Well, I, I keep training, Jules. I think we discussed this before. I'm, I'm one of the hungry athletes, you know? <laughs> At this time, presenting, ladies and gentlemen, Hard Boyle Haggerty in the ring now. Today is the heyday of the pretty boy. Kowalski is called killer for helping Gene Stanley of Chicago. She likes it. Oh, boy, that can hurt. Right here at ringside, while we go in for a riot of rough house, that's flatly called wrestling. Always a fine condition, wrestler. Against Lou Fez, the international heavyweight wrestling champion. Should be a very fine wrestling match. Lou Fez was an original in a profession of many wannabes. He was born on the 24th of April, 1916, and was an active part of the wrestling world for over 50 years. His last professional fight taking place when he was in his late 70s. He was the undisputed world heavyweight champion six times, and held the title for a combined total of 18 years. This was a man for whom the bell truly told. St. Louis, yeah, St. in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, uh, used to do a lot of swimming in the, in the old Mississippi River. I used to walk down there with a couple of my buddies, and we would swim during the day there and get sun, and one of them had a canoe, and we'd cross the river and do some fishing, and this as a kid, you know. And then worked in my father's shoe repair shop, too. And uh, as you know, the Europeans do, why, whatever your father does for a living, why, that's what you may inherit, you know. And I liked that, but as I became adult, I could see that that wasn't going to be my bag, that I thought professional wrestling was not only more interesting, but I got so interested in the sport and got competitive to the point that uh, I tried to begin to travel even at a very early age. I was 17, and I was traveling as a professional wrestler. And St. Louis never had a hometown boy, and when I finally got a shot at the title, I, I had won several matches, and, and with the amateur coaches who were taking me all through the state and so forth, and I was doing quite well with that. But then uh, I, uh, uh, the promoter could see that I was drawing money in spite of the fact that I was just a wrestler. And that was the hallmark of my success. And later, it really, with Ed Stranger Lewis ha managing my uh, PR and traveling with me, why, we, we had, uh, Ed had the magic, I did not. I was just a kid. And he could walk into a sports editor and say, I've got a kid that's a great wrestler. The kid can't say that, but he can, you know, and that's, that's the way it went. And he sold me, and we sold wrestling, and we did very well financially. 34, 35, I was really emerging as a wrestler at that time. And at 36, in 1936, I was traveling extensively. 37, I won the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. From the beginning, I was earning five dollars for a match, but uh, toward the uh, uh, after I won the title, I was in a very good negotiating position, and uh, I was making like uh, from like zero to twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year, forty, fifty. Finally, got to the point where I was making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year, but that was after several years of work, of course. What was happening on the world scene in the late 30s was not up to Lou. World War II had erupted in Europe, and within two years, America and most of our world was thrust into combat. Lou, like many of America's young and finest, soon found himself enlisted. And we had a, uh, a general, a three-star general, was checking, checking us all out. 
So I went through there and he walked right by me and I looked in and he came back and did a double take on me. He said, are you a wrestler? I said, yes, sir. And he said, I think I saw you wrestle in Washington, D.C. I said, that's very possible. Anyway, he said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, I'm in the Army, sir. <laughs> that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> and he said, he said, uh, would you entertain the thought of doing a hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, unit for us? I said, well, if I couldn't do that, sir, I've wasted my life. I said, I could, that would be an easy thing for me to do, and I'd love to do it. And so they took me out of formation and uh, interviewed me again, and uh, that's what I did. I, hand, I taught hand-to-hand -hand combat during World War II. And I, I really did, not to be boastful, but I, I showed them some things that they did not have in the manual that would be very productive. And I told him, he said, well, what do you think about our program? I said, well, I don't want to be a smart aleck here, but I said, from what I see in this manual here, you do just as well to have your people pick up a rock and throw it at somebody. <laughs> and, and he said, that isn't too good, is it? I said, no, sir, it isn't. When the war finally came to an end in 1945, men and women all over the world came home. It was a different world from the one they had left just a few years earlier. And for some, the transition was very difficult. But for Lou, with his feet firmly back on the wrestling mat, life was pretty good. The late 40s, very good years. Oh, God, yeah. In Los Angeles, uh, I would get out there and, and, and yeah. I was, I was living in a, in a great hotel right on the beach there. And Chandra Zabo, my very dear friend from Hungary, uh, he would get me in the, in the Santa Monica Swimming Club. And we were living elegantly and making at least $5,000 a week. It was wonderful. It was an era that really was productive. God, it just it spoiled everybody, yeah, including me. It spoiled all of us. Boy. Years ago, when they found a real sharp, young wrestler, and that's the only one I speak wrestling, and probably other sports too, but a, a, a young wrestler, they would take and cultivate him and do what they could and get all the press they could on him, all the newspaper publicity, everything. And it would take like three or four or five years to get a guy, what we call over, really, that he's well known and has enough recognition that he, he has some, you know. But with television, instead of years, you're talking about making a guy in weeks. I'm the world's greatest wrestler the world's finest German wrestler, and the world's most perfect conditioned wrestler. Starting in the 60s, uh, rather than uh, retaliate with a wrestling move or maybe an, uh, an elbow to the head or something, now they're hitting uh, each other in the head with garbage cans or garbage lid or uh, goofy things, things that are not related to wrestling. And uh, once the people get accustomed to that, uh, I don't think they're even interested in seeing a wrestling match. By 1961, East Germany had decided to erect the Berlin Wall, and the Cold War had begun. In the USA, President John F. Kennedy had just been elected, but to America's flower children and Lou Thez, who had now reached the age of 45, international politics seemed a long way away. Life seemed more like an endless bed of roses. Lou was now living in the Lucerne Valley in Southern California. He would spend many hours riding around his 120-acre ranch with his wife Frida and son Jeffrey. Lou, in fact, now owned more than one home. His wife was a talented artist whose work hunting several colleges. But the family spent most of their time in the exclusive beach town of La Jolla, California, surfing and deep sea fishing. Lou was at that time living almost the dream life, spending many hours playing and wrestling with his son. Strangely, Lou did not want to see his son become a professional wrestler, though he did claim that if his son had made that decision, he would have helped him. Around La Jolla, Lou's classic old roaster was a familiar sight. It was Lou's own personal trademark. In just 25 years of ring competition, Lou had earned over $2 million, a massive sum of money back in 1961. 
it had brought Lou all the good things in life. He owned and lived in this 20-unit apartment house right on the La Jolla beachfront. Away from the ring, his dominant interest at that time was real estate. At home, Lou and his wife loved to throw huge barbecue parties, and Lou made sure there was always lots to eat. In fact, Lou, who had a huge appetite, would on occasion eat a 10-pound sirloin steak in just one go. As Lou put it, I was born hungry, and I think I will die hungry. In fact, I have always lived in the thought and dread that perhaps one day I will end up broke. And that was why Lou always worked so hard and never quit because in earlier days, he had experienced some very black times. Lou went on to say it was this black period in his life that put the steel in him. And uh, I thought that perhaps, well, this, this could be it. I'm going to be beaten now. I wouldn't tolerate it. I would just say, well, not now. It, it will have to be later. And I think that little difference, the difference of going hungry a time or two, helps a lot. These are the 1960 officers of the World Wide Wrestling Association. They were the matchmakers for Southern California. It was run by Sandor Zabo and former world champion Jules Strongbow. A match has been arranged. It will pit the traditional and classic style of Blue Fez against the wild and unpredictable Mr. Moto. What about Lou Fez two, uh, two weeks from Friday? Friday. One of your Madison's. Yeah, he's open Friday, Jules. It's okay. Yeah, that's okay, Vince. Okay, then, boy. I'll be calling you in a couple of days. Before the fight, Mr. Moto treats the audience to the ponderous ritual practiced by the sumo wrestlers of Japan. There had been no gimmicks in Lou's victory, just the pure classical skills of one of wrestling's greatest, exactly what his fans had come to know and expect. In 1970 and 75 and so forth, the fact that I had wrestled and defeated Ricky Dozan uh, in uh, Hawaii, that gave me a handle to go to uh, Japan anytime I wanted to and all I would have to do is come in there and referee a match Just a referee and then now this is gonna really sound stupid But I got in the ring there one time and 60,000 people in the Tokyo Dome and I just got into referee That's all and I got a standing ovation You know and I said this is stupid. I said you got some great wrestlers coming out here in just a little while You don't have to stand up to see me. I said I'm just gonna officiate this thing, you know I've had all my, my fingers and knuckles broken, and my thumbs have been broken three or four times each, and uh, the joints are quite enlarged because of that, just as some of the fighters do. And it's an occupational hazard. It's just one of those things. Uh, the only time that uh, an injury can be really serious, to my way of thinking, is if you have bad concussions, if you have more than one, and uh, they hang on, I think a fellow should stop wrestling. The worst injury that I ever had, I've had a couple of them that were not pieces of cake. Uh, my fractured my left patella when I wrestled Bronco Nagurski. Uh, I beat him the first fall in 11 minutes, and I told his, his manager at ringside, I said, this guy's not a wrestler, I'm gonna get him. And he said, yeah, I know. But anyway, he hit me with a tackle in the second fall, knocked me over the top rope, he vaulted me. He was a brute, the guy was really 
very strong. The next one I did was wrestling Carl Gotch, and uh, I used a Greco Roman backdrop on him, and he used a very exclusive, uh, uh, sophisticated block that I didn't think he knew, and he blocked me, broke four of my ribs, and uh, I was laid up for about three months. Uh, but that was those are the two. I have many broken. I've had, had 200 broken bones. The great wrestler from Japan, Inoki, and uh, I got myself wired for this one. I, you know. And he was really very popular in Japan. He was really the champion. So I went out there, and the bell rang, and I, I fainted for his leg, and he grabbed, the, grabbed, grabbed my head to straighten me up, and that's exactly what I wanted from him. And I, a Greco Roman back dropped him, dropped him, and got a quick three count on him. Eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Lou had reached his 60s and was still fighting. And in this match in Japan, Inoki took the opportunity to claim his revenge. Lutez, yeah, I think the greatest wrestler in my dream too. I was young, and some people say maybe uh, uh, Lutez Jr. to call me, you know. I'm so proud. <laughs> uh, you've been a champion in one sport. Uh, would you have any idea that perhaps you would like to? win the, uh, the title in professional wrestling? Well, that would be an honor, but I think Lou Thier is a little too tough for me right now. In our professional wrestling world, I have the honor to meet a man who was an asset in and out of the ring. His name was Lou Thies. Lou Thies is the epitome, the greatest champion of all time, of all time, a champion in and out of the ring, a gentleman at all times, one hell of a wrestler. This guy must have wrestled till he was 80 years old and still tough as hell. And he's still got a tough spring in his rock. One of the toughest guys I've ever known. And when they say, Haggerty, you're going to wrestle Luthez, I say, oh my God. <laughs> it was tough. I couldn't sleep that night just thinking about that. All the moves this guy's going to make, and he's going to drive me crazy because he liked to wrestle. And he was, re he was the best. I, I retired about 10 times already. But, uh, I wrestled at 74 in Japan, and uh, that's enough for me. I keep saying this, but uh, I was old enough to know better, but I did it anyway. I've mellowed a lot since then, and it, we all go with, with time. Father time takes all of us, and uh, I still feel my health is good and so forth, but so far as being uh, getting in a competition, no way. No, no, it's all over. I enjoyed it while it lasted, yeah. I'm on my third marriage, but we've been married now 25 years, and everything is fine. I picked him up in a motel. No, seriously. I was working at the Downtowner in Nashville, Tennessee, and he was a guest there. And everyone kept saying, do you know who that is? And I kept saying, yes, it's the guest in room 120, because he always had to have the queen-size bed. And so eventually, of course, everyone kept saying, that's the wrestler. She said, how old are you? And um, I said, how old are you? You know, so she told me, and I, so I calculated real quick. And I said, well, I'm 59. And I was actually 60 at the time. Because she said one time, she said, I, I, I really don't want to marry, be married to an old man. I said, well, how old is, how old is, you have to be to be old? She said, well, 60's old, pretty old for me, you know. I said, well, I'm 59. She said, well, you just got in under the wire, you know? <laughs> He's exciting. I've never been bored. As you've noticed here today, it's always busy, always something happening. He represents a passion, not just sexual passion, but a passion for wrestling, and it has become his whole life, and I guess it's just sort of enveloped me in the thrill of it all. Um, it's meeting the people and seeing their reaction to him, and yet knowing that he's a human being.
that he's not an icon, that he's really no different from the rest of us. Um, he forgets our anniversary, forgets my birthday, it's Christmas Day, that's really hard to forget. And yet he brings me tea every morning. So he means, I imagine what every husband means to a wife when they love each other. He's just a part of who I am and I'm a part of who he is. Everyone told me when I married someone 30 years older that I'd have to face that day, but 25 years later I'm beginning to wonder if he's not gonna live forever. But I think the way I will remember Lou is a great deal like everyone will remember him. He is first and foremost a wrestler. And I think that's what makes a champion in any industry that they are totally, totally focused. And Lou is self-educated, he's fascinated by other things, but wrestling is who and what he is. It's been a wonderful life, and I just, and I said this so many times, I wish I could do it again, but I just cannot, but it's been a wonderful uh, experience, and I've been very, very lucky, very lucky to even be here. Uh, if I were to have an epitaph, the thing that I would like to be remembered by is a thing that the wrestling coach said was like, if it is to be, it is up to me. And that will serve you through your entire lifetime in any business, any enterprise you get into. If it is to be, it is up to me. Do the best you can with the tools you've got and you'll, you'll be fine. That's it. Lou Thez finally waved goodbye to us on August 28, 2002. He had wrestled professionally in the ring for seven decades and was to many who had the privilege to meet or witness him in action a gentleman of the highest regard, true to himself, his wife, his family, and his many friends, and always to the sport he loved. He was truly an icon of the wrestling world. I spend my life, all of my life, learning to wrestle. It's the only means of livelihood I've ever had, and uh, the only gimmick that I have in wrestling is wrestling. Please refer to your manual.